Thank you, Dr. DeRose. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Good to see each of you here. I want to welcome any visitors that are here today. And um, I see there are some people still standing in the back. We do have some seats up front that seem to be eternally available. <laughs> but if you're not afraid, come on up front. <laughs> I want to welcome those who may be worshiping with us through our uh, online ministry. We know we have a lot of friends that uh, are view the programs either uh, delayed, some live. We want to welcome you. Some are online members. We have some digital churches. You know, there are churches around the country, they don't have a pastor. And so what they do is they record our program, and when it comes time for the sermon, they press play, and uh, they're worshiping with us sometimes the very day, even the very moment. And we want to welcome them as well. Our message today is talking about Balaam, prophet for sale. Balaam, his name appears about 63 times in the Bible, all the way from the book of Numbers to the book of Revelation. That's a very interesting character, has somewhat of a tragic story, but it has some very good and positive things that we can learn from the story of Balaam about God and the choices that are made. Now you find the, the story of Balaam, if you go to the book of Numbers, of course that's there in the first five books of Moses, go to Numbers and it'll begin with uh, chapter 22 and the story that we're going to consider carries over into chapter 25. I will not read every word, but I will read quite a bit. So if you can go to Numbers chapter 22, and I'd like to give you a little bit of the background of what's going on here. Children of Israel have now spent 40 years going through the wilderness. You remember one point they were at the borders of the Jordan, but they had lost faith when they believed the negative report of those 10 spies. And as a result of not believing that God could bring them into the promised land, that older generation never made it to the promised land. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so God said, I'll bring the next generation in, assuming they believe. And after 40 years, they came once again to the borders of the Promised Land on the Jordan. Now, there were three nations on the east side of the Jordan they had to go by that were technically related. Uh, you had the Moabites, the Edomites, and the Ammonites. The Edomites were the descendants of Esau. They at one time had worshiped Jehovah, but they had strayed. The Ammonites were the descendants of Lot, as were the Moabites. Remember, Lot's two daughters had Ammon and Moab. At one time, they believed in the true God, but they had strayed in their faith. And as Moses uh, approached these nations, he would say to the king of the Ammonites, look, we have no quarrel with you. We just need to go through your territory to go from the desert into the land God has given us. Uh, allow us to pass through. Uh, we'll pay for any water that we drink. If there's any grass that our cattle eat, we'll, re we'll uh, recompense you for that. And they said, you're not to come through our land. In fact, they even attacked them. But God gave Israel victory against the Ammonites and some of these other kings like Og and the king of Bashan. And, and right next to Edom and Ammon was Moab. Remember, Ruth came from the tribe of Moab. Now, i got a map we're going to put on the screen to just try to give you a little visual picture. You see there, I'm here in the very south of Moab. You've got where the land of Edom is. The children of Israel were told they had to go around Moab. They said, well, we don't want you coming through our land. So they went around Moab. It was a more difficult route. And now they're camped in the Acacia Grove. And they're in the northern territory of Moab, but it's still making Moab very uncomfortable that this big nation who had just defeated their enemies, the Ammonites, you would have thought they'd been happy, but then maybe we're next on the list. And so this is the backdrop. Israel is preparing to cross the Jordan, to attack Jericho, to enter the Promised Land. They've got no quarrel with their relatives, the Moabites. And even though the Moabites had drifted far from God and now we're worshiping a god mom a god named uh, Chimoth. And they were even practicing child sacrifice. Later in the Bible, you read a story about one of the Moabite kings that when he was losing a battle, he offered his son on the walls, who was the crown prince. And so they had drifted very far from God, but God had told uh, Moses and the people, 
you, you're not to try and pick a fight with Edom, Moab, or Ammon, but they picked a fight with Israel. So here's where the story takes up. Chapter 22, Numbers, verse 1. Then the children of Israel moved and camped in the plains of Moab on the side of Jordan across from Jericho. So as we showed you on the map, get ready to cross over. Now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was exceedingly afraid because they were many. And Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. So Moab said to the elders of Midian, now the Midianites and the Moabites were somewhat confederate, they were friends. Uh, the Midianites were the children of Abraham's wife Keturah. A lot of them dwelt in the deserts. But uh, so they, they had an alliance. And so uh, the king, Balak of Moab, he spoke to the Midianites and he said, look, this company is gonna come and they're gonna lick up everything around us. <laughs> the name Balak means lick up, I think that's interesting. Mm -hmm. As an ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at the time. Then he sent messengers to Balaam the son of Beor at Pethor, which is near the river. Now this is quite a distance. This is going 350 miles across mountain and desert back to the area where Jacob picked up his wife, wives, Rachel, Leah, and the two handmaids. And it's the area near Haran. It's on the Euphrates River. It's one of the closest points of the Euphrates River to the land of Israel, but it's still you travel by camel back then or horse, it depends on how ambitious you are, you're still talking about 25, 30 day trip one way to go up there. And so um, and they had a long journey. Uh, I take that back. It, for a round trip, I meant to say round trip, it would be almost a month to go there. You could do it in 50, 20 miles a day, 30 miles a day, you could make it then. And so um, he sends these messengers all the way up there. Now who is Balaam? And the word Balaam means consumer. Um, he is a prophet. He had been a prophet of God. Keep in mind, there were still some people that worshipped the one true God. They were monotheistic by the Euphrates River. Where did Abraham come from? He came from Mesopotamia. And where did Jacob go to get his wife? He went back to that same country. And so there were people there that knew about the true God. You remember there were certain wise men, Magi, that came from the east looking for the Son of God. There were people in that country that knew about the true God. Balaam was a prophet. He wasn't a, a Jew by birth. He may have been a Semite. You know where the word Semite means? You know when someone is anti-Semitic. It means from Shem, a Shemite. It's just a corruption of the word. Descendants of Shem, the son of Noah. And they said that's where the Semites came from. And so he, he may have been among those people and worshiped the same God and been very popular. A lot of his prophecies and predictions had come true. But with success, he started to struggle with pride and even some of the rewards of being a famous prophet. Covetousness became a problem. And so they, sent, they said, look, there's this great prophet. Uh, let's send and get him to come. And say, look, this people has come from Egypt. See, they cover the face of the earth and they're sitting next to me. Therefore, please come at once, curse this people for me, for they're too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that who you bless is blessed and who you curse is cursed. And so they send these emissaries. They come with their gifts in their hand and they go and they approach Balaam. Now, what's happening here is Balak, uh, it's easy to get Balak and Balaam mixed up. Balak is the bad king of Moab. <coughs> He's looking for Balaam, who at least one time was a true prophet. He sees that when he looks from the cliffs of Moab, the camp of Israel is glowing at night because there's a pillar of fire above the camp. He sees the people go out in the morning and they are picking up f food off the ground God is feeding them with bread. He sees there's this miraculous river that seems to run from a rock through the camp and irrigate things for everybody. It is so clear that God is with them. They have just defeated nations that were much bigger than them. And he thought, 
they've got God on their side. My God, Chimash, is weaker than their God. I need to get someone who knows about their God so I can fight fire with fire. If I get a worshiper of Jehovah to come and put a whammy on them, curse them, go through his incantations. You know, they didn't understand how God works, but if he'll just pronounce a curse, get a voodoo doll of Moses and poke it with pins, something to weaken them so they'll be cursed and maybe I can then attack them and I'll have some advantage. And so they figured, they've got a God on their side, I need to get their God on my side by getting someone who knows their God and, and they sent them. And this is not the first time this happened in the Bible. If you remember when the children of Israel, the northern ten tribes, were carried off by the Assyrians, the Assyrians then sent some of their people back into the land of northern Israel. And there was a plague of lions that were killing all, all the people, man-eaters. So they said, it's because we don't know about the God of the land. If you send some of the priests of Israel into the land and teach people the ways of the God of the land, then maybe we'll be protected. And that's how you end up with the Samaritans, where you've got these people who are pagans, but they believe the five books of Moses and went back to the king of Assyria sending priests of God to teach them because they thought, well, you got to fight fire with fire. And so he thought, well, let's go get Balaam. If we can get him, he's the best known prophet in all of the East. If he just cursed them, then everything will be okay. And so he sends these honored, well-dressed emissaries and they've got great gifts with them. Verse 15. So, uh, no, I'm not at verse 15 yet, sorry. And uh, so the elders of Moab, in verse 7, the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian depart with the diviner's fee. They've got their credit card. There's a gift that they're supposed to give. In their hand, and they came to Balaam and they spoke to him in the words of Balak. They repeated what they said. These people have come, will you come and curse them? Now, he knows right away, these are people that God has blessed. Uh, Balaam is aware, everyone in that country is aware. They don't have the internet, but they got caravans. That was the fast way to communicate. And as the caravans went throughout that country in trade, they brought the news with them, and they knew how God had dried up the Red Sea for Israel. Balaam knew that the true God that he worshipped was protecting these people. But he saw the diviner's fee, and he thought, well, look, I can't charge them if I don't do anything. Uh, maybe if I make them spend the night and, you know, I'll say, look, I'll, you know, it does cost to at least inquire. If you want to submit a form, there is a cost. You submit with the form. And so he acts like, well, I'm not supposed to do this, but, you know, I'll see what else the Lord has to say because he wants the money. And uh, they brought the diviners to me and Balaam spoke uh, the words, to, they spoke the words of Balak. And he said to them, lodge here tonight. And I'll bring back word as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab and Midian stayed with Balaam. Then God came to Balaam and said to him, Who are these men with you? Is that because God doesn't know? Or is God saying, Balaam, why are you entertaining the enemies of my people? Who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, he begins to repeat things to God like God doesn't know. It's like Elijah on Mount Sinai when he starts complaining. Balak, the son of Zephor, king of Moab, has sent them to me, saying, Look, a people have come out of Egypt, and they cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse them for me. Perhaps I'll be able to overpower them and drive them out. And God says to Balaam, as clear as it can be, You shall not, isn't that like the Ten Commandments? You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed, understandably, blessed by me. So that's about as clear as it can be. But he's regretting that he's trying to find some compromise, some middle ground where he can still get paid. Reluctantly, Balaam rose in the morning and he said to the princes of Balak, go back to your land, for the Lord has refused to give me permission to go with you. <laughs> Sounds like a kid who says, my mom won't let me go out and play. I want to go, but the Lord won't let me go. He doesn't tell him why. He doesn't say what the Lord said. He just says, I can't go. And the princes of Moab, disappointed, they've just gone, you know, a 20-day journey, two-week journey over tough desert mountains. And they rose and they went back to Balaam. And they said, 
Balaam refuses to come with us. Then Balaam again sent princes. Maybe they got, you know, they said, yeah, maybe this wasn't enough money. Maybe he didn't understand the situation. You sometimes wish that God's people had the, the uh, determination of the devil. Uh, and you say, boy, he works like the devil. We give the devil credit for being a hard worker, don't we? Determination, tenacity, resolve. <coughs> I remember uh, a friend who was a Bible salesman, and he was a hard worker. He's very successful. He said, it's amazing. The harder I work, the luckier I get. <laughs> he doesn't give up. Balak again sends princes. While the others are resting, he gets a new batch, a bigger emissary group. More numerous, more honorable. They got better clothes, better position than the others. And they come. It says, you know, it only takes a second or two to say, and they came to Balaam. But here you go. Another couple weeks go by. They bring a caravan protecting these great rewards. And they say to him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, Please let nothing hinder you. What? Not even God? Let nothing hinder you from coming to me. For I will certainly honor you greatly. And I will do whatever you say to me. Therefore, please come curse this people for me. He's basically saying, name your reward. I'm a king. I'm giving you a blank check. It's even better than when Herod said to the stepdaughter, or to the daughter of Herodias, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. He said, name it. I'll do whatever you want. I'll do whatever you say to me. Come, I'll honor you. It also appealed to him when, you know, the early, the first group, they came in and they said, we know that who you bless is blessed and who you curse is cursed. You've got the power. And so this is starting to work on him and he kind of wants to go. He should have said, look, I told you no. <laughs> I remember I called someone and asked, I thought, well, he'd be a great administrative pastor. This is years ago when I called this guy. And he said, well, thanks so much, Doug, but no. But I thought, well, he would be great. So I called him again. And I talked to him on the phone. I said, you know, we could do this together. We'll do that together. What do you want? And finally, he said to me, kind of hurt my feelings. He said, uh, what part of no don't you understand? <laughs> I felt a little rebuked. <laughs> and it's like God told Balaam, no. But they come back and they said, oh, but you didn't understand. You got to come. You got to come right now. And he's going to give you big rewards, great honor, whatever you want. You must be crazy. Of course you can come. You, you got power. You're the prophet. You just talk to God. You tell him what to do. Uh, you know, the pagans always thought that they could manipulate their gods with certain, they'd go through these ceremonies and they'd sacrifice and they'd manipulate their gods. And they didn't understand, no, God tells us what to do. And he, Balaam knew that. And yet he said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you spend another night here? Now he should never have done that. God had already given his answer. They're asking the same question. And uh, come back. He says, look, though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I can't go beyond the word of my Lord God to do less or more. But uh, maybe you should spend the night. We'll pray about it. <laughs> you ever seen anyone do that? They know what God tells them. But they think, I'm just going to pray about it. Uh, I've seen this happen many times with this very scenario where they know the Bible says they should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, but they find an unbeliever that is tall, dark, and handsome. And they think, oh, you know, I'm going to pray about it so I can feel spiritual while I disobey. Uh, I'm going to pray about it. And, uh, you know, I know the Bible says this, but uh, it's amazing. You can rationalize almost anything if you want to. People can talk themselves into doing all kinds of things the Bible clearly forbids. Just pray about it. <laughs> he said, look, I'll talk to the Lord again. God already gave an answer. It's kind of like when Jonah, he was a little bit of a misguided prophet too, wasn't he? He ran from the word of the Lord, took a detour through the digestive system of a fish, because he did not want to go to Nineveh. He comes out of the fish, and the word of the Lord comes to Jonah, and it says the exact same thing that it said the first time. Arise and go to Nineveh. He didn't want to do it. He tried to talk himself out of it. It didn't end well. 
If you know what God wants, you always want to do what the Word of God says. Amen? Amen. So uh, now, therefore, stay here tonight. I might know what more the Lord will say to me. And God came to Balaam at night and said, If the men come to call you, rise and go with them. But only the word that I speak to you, you shall do. Now, why would you want to make a trip that's 30 days round trip across a desert and know you're not going to be able to deliver what the king wants and get the rewards? Balaam was scheming and dreaming and thinking all along the way. Maybe he was an older prophet and he thought his prime was past. Maybe the locals weren't giving him enough recognition or respect. Maybe he had a spending problem and he was needing the money. But for whatever reason, he really wanted these rewards. So he, even though he shouldn't have been going, he took off on this trip. He rose in the morning, he saddled his donkey, and he went with the princess. He takes two servants with him. Then God's anger was aroused because he went. Didn't God just give him permission to go? Maybe it was something of a test. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. And he was riding on his donkey, and well, I want to stop here. Didn't God call Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt? <laughs> Do you know that as Moses was on his way to Pharaoh, the angel of the Lord stood in the way against him to slay him? Have you read that strange little... Because when God called Moses, he said, look, you're to be leading the people. You're to be my spokesman. And by the way, you know all about the rite of circumcision, but you've not circumcised your sons yet. And Moses said, yeah, Lord, I know, I know, yeah, we'll take care of that. But he didn't. And he was on his way to lead the nation back to God, and he was not following God in his own family because maybe his wife thought it was barbaric. Evidently, when you read the story, she was upset. And uh, there was some family dispute. He was putting his wife ahead of his God. And God stood in the way as an adversary with a drawn sword to slay Moses. Now, first of all, keep in mind, if God wants to slay you, can he do it? So it's pretty clear God didn't really want. He said, look, you're in danger of very serious judgment. And God doesn't miss when he shoots. And so if the angel really wanted to slay him, he'd be dead. He was basically sending an angel to warn him, to save him, and say, you are living in disobedience. And this is what happened to Balaam. As he's on his way, he's thinking, now, maybe I can do this, maybe I can do that. And how can I get this reward? And I'll submit to you that as he was on his way to Moab, Balaam was beginning to think, well, I may not be able to curse him, because whatever I say, God's going to put a blessing. But I know ways where God will withdraw his blessing if they disobey God. God will withdraw his blessing. And he's thinking thoughts he shouldn't be thinking. The angel knows that. God knows that. And he sends the angel and says, look, your way is perverse before me. You're not going to deliver my message. You're still going and you're scheming how you might get the rewards. Pastor Doug, are you making that up? No, that's what Peter says. I'll read it to you in a minute. That's what Jude says. That's what Revelation says. That's what Joshua says. They all refer to Balaam and say he was conspiring because of covetousness and greed. Has we seen that happen before? You ever seen an evangelist go bad? They say that when it comes to an evangelist, it's either the honey or the money. <clears throat> they get mixed up with girls or greed. It's uh, covetousness or it's uh, Cynthia. <laughs> trying to find something I don't see in it. But it, it's one of the two. And I've seen it happen. And it happens slowly. You get some young, on fire, sincere evangelist. They got the gift of evangelism. And you know, the Bible sometimes calls it the gift of prophecy. Paul refers to preaching as the gift of prophecy. And they're persuading others. And they're up there preaching and people are coming and they're seeing great results. And then someone says, oh, if I could just get an outline of your sermon. So they make a couple of Xerox copies of their sermon. They realize, well, you know, that costs something. So they say, a dollar for, you know, my sermon outline. People, no problem. And they say, you know, I could probably sell cassette tapes. No problem. I'll be honest with you, friends. When I went into evangelism, this is back in the days of cassette, audio cassette. I met Karen. She was helping me make labels for the cassettes because I couldn't keep up with it. People were buying hundreds. It scared me hundreds of sets of our programs. 
And I could see very quickly how an evangelist could get in trouble. And then they started selling their DVDs. And I knew one evangelist. Then they started a little side business. They started selling multi-level marketing products during their evangelistic program, trying to get all the other members to sell their product for them. And pretty soon the money's rolling in. And I know one evangelist, he left evangelism. He said, I'm going to go on. I'm making so much more money doing these other things. I'll make a million dollars and I'll put it into God's work. I said, brother, you'll never come back. You're going to fix your eyes on the money and you're going to take your eyes off the goal. And they never came back to God's work. Oh, well, they may have made a lot of money. Or you've maybe seen some of these pastors that are on TV and they say, well, God is going to bless you and he's going to heal you and he's going to get you that new rototiller or pickup truck, whatever you need. If you give to my ministry and you plant the seed of faith, he's going to give you whatever you want. People are so desperate, they buy it. And then you've got these evangelists that are flying around and they've got a fleet of jets and they've got their entourage and bodyguards everywhere they go and they do this name it, claim it, blab it, grab it ministry. Oh, prosperity preachers, and it's all about follow Jesus so you can be rich. Was that Christ's message? Little by little, something had happened to Balaam. So God stands as an adversary to him along the way. And now in verse 22 of chapter 22, the anger of the Lord was aroused because he went. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. And he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in his way with a drawn sword in his hand. Some of you remember when David, and this is in 1 Chronicles chapter 20, David was numbering Israel he wasn't supposed to, and a plague ended up coming on the people of Israel. David looked above Jerusalem, and he saw an angel with a drawn sword above Mount Zion. By the way, that was the incident that led David to pick the threshing floor of Ornan as the place where Solomon's temple would be built. The angel was directly above that place. And David said to Ornan, we need to make an offering to God and ask him to forgive us for my pride. The whole nation was suffering because of what he had done. And um, they made an offering there and God, the angel, put away his sword and the plague stopped. How many of you remember that story? An angel with a drawn sword. Or if a, with a Greek, the sword of, what is it, Damocles? Hanging by a thread? I wonder if some of those mythologies came from the Bible. And the donkey saw the angel. And the donkey saw the angel standing in the way with his drawn sword. He turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back onto the road. So the donkey... Maybe the angel vanished temporarily. He gets back into the road. Now the donkey's looking a little nervous. And then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she couldn't turn around, so she tried to just get over on the shoulder, and she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. And the, it's kind of like pounding the steering wheel on your car when you're mad. Then the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn to the right or the left. And when the donkey saw the... You notice that the way keeps getting more and more narrow. I've seen that before. People know that they're not living in God's will. And first, you know, they kind of... God gets their attention out in the field and then they bump their foot against the wall and then they get in a place where there is no passing. God is trying to get their attention. Things continue to get narrow and narrow because they're not walking in the way of the Lord. You ever had that experience? He went down. There's no way to go right or left. And when the donkey saw the angel, all she could do was stop and lay down under Balaam. So Balaam's anger was aroused. He hops off the donkey and he strikes. He makes it sound like he's beating the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you struck me these three times? <laughs> and Balaam said to the donkey, Why are you talking? No, he doesn't even ask that question. He is so mad. <laughs> Balaam said to the donkey, Because you've abused me, I wish there were a sword in my hand. Now, wouldn't you kill a talking donkey? 
How much would a talking donkey be worth? He's clearly not thinking. Clearly. He said, if there's a sword in my hand, I, I would have killed you. So the donkey said to Balaam, they're having this conversation. So the donkey says to Balaam, am I not your donkey on which you have ridden ever since I became yours to this day? Donkeys can live, you know, 25 years. Was I ever disposed, the donkey's got a good vocabulary. Was I ever disposed to do this to you? And he said, uh, no. He starts to think, and all of a sudden he realizes I'm talking to my donkey. <laughs> then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes. Now you notice that the donkey has better vision than Balaam. He sees sooner than Balaam does. It's interesting in the Bible that uh, the devil spoke through a serpent. The Lord spoke through a donkey. A humble animal. Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem. The donkey was beaten three times. You know, the children of Israel were three times dispossessed from their land. But in spite of the ups and downs of Israel, God spoke through that nation. You don't look at the nation of Israel and say, what a nation of godly geniuses. You look at the history of Israel, and keep in mind, I'm Jewish, I'm not trying to be derogatory. You look at the history of Israel, and it is one of continual backsliding. And God said to them, I did not pick you because you were the best people in the world. You were a stubborn and a stiff-necked people. Isn't that what the Bible says? Mm -hmm. And you might think, well, I'm better than them. No, because they are a type of people everywhere. But even though they were a nation of slaves, he committed to them his word of truth. God can speak through a donkey. Every time I get up and preach, I'm reminded of that. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, you know, what sinner has the right to stand before lost people and say, I'm going to let God speak through me? Except you know that God can speak through a donkey. And so, all of a sudden his eyes were open. You remember on the road to Emmaus, Jesus was preaching to the disciples and they didn't know it was Jesus. And after Jesus blessed the bread, their eyes were opened. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed his head and he fell flat on his face, I guess. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why have you struck your donkey these three times? Now it's interesting that the first thing the angel says to him is not, why are you going on this wayward mission? The angel says, why are you being so cruel to your animal? You know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs that a righteous man regards the life of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. God made man in his own image, but God also made the creatures. And man was given dominion to the world to be a loving leader over the creatures, just as God is a loving leader of man. And you'd never know sometimes that uh, the way that people treat animals and I'm not you know, talking like I'm on some fringe movement here. I'm just saying that uh, one of the ways you know that a Christian is a Christian is that his dog does not run and hide under the porch when he comes home. Have you ever met a dog and the dog is always cowering and you wonder, what happens when I leave? Then you meet a Christian's dog and they're, you know, they're licking you half to death and they're happy and you can tell they're real secure because they're treated well. No, that's not always true. Right? The animals know. I think they're more intelligent than we give them credit for. So the angel is saying, why did you strike your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me. Now when it says the angel of the Lord, now the angel says your way is perverse before me. His way was perverse before the Lord. Sometimes when it says the angel of the Lord, it's what you call a Christophany. It's Christ appearing in his pre-incarnation form as he did to Abraham and Jacob. This could be one of those times. The donkey saw me and he turned aside from me these three times. He's basically saying the donkey is smarter than you. If she had not turned aside for me, surely I would have killed you and let her live. Here, Balaam was being saved by the donkey. We're saved by one who rode on a donkey, right? For his sake, we're saved. 
So you're beating your donkey, and it was a donkey that saved your life. And we crucify Christ afresh, not realizing it's the sacrifice of Christ that keeps us alive. And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it displeases you, what do you mean, if it displeases you? If it displeases you, I'll turn back. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men. But only the word that I speak to you, that shall you speak. Now, evidently, the emissaries are going out ahead of him. They didn't see this event. Balaam is going on a little more slowly. And he's got his, his a servant with him. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. Now, when Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him. The word came from the emissaries. He's coming. He's finally coming. He goes out to meet him near the border of the Arnon, the boundary of the territory. Then Balak said to Balaam, Did I not earnestly send you, calling for you? Why did you not come to me? Am I not able to honor you? He can't understand. Didn't you hear? I, I'm giving you a blank check. What took you so long? Why did you say no the first time? And Balak said, Balaam says to Balak, Look, I've now come to you. Have I any power at all to say anything? He's still trembling from the encounter with the angel. The word that God puts in my mouth, that I must speak. Now, that's actually good advice for all of us. When it comes to sharing your faith, um, be faithful to simply use the word of God. The power is in the word. The word that God puts in my mouth, that I must speak. So Balaam went with Balak, and they came to Kirjath Herzoth. Then Balak offered oxen and sheep, and he sent some to Balaam and to the princes who were with him. So it was the next day that Balak took Balaam and brought him up to the high places of Baal, that from there he might ex observe the extent of the people of Israel. You can see the people of Israel. There could have been over a million of them. It's like 600,000 men between 20 and higher that can fight. That's what we know about the number. You can use that to extrapolate how many other uh, older men or younger men and women and children were there. There was easily over a million people spread out in this great plain. So Balaam says, all right, you want to hear what the Lord has to say? Here's how this is going to work. I'm in chapter 23. Build seven altars here and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. Now there, he's doing an offering the way they did when they served Jehovah. The sacrificial system God gave to Adam and Eve. Just clean animals. And Balak did as Balaam had spoken. And Balak and Balaam offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Then Balaam said to Balak, Stand by your burnt offering, and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come and meet with me, and whatever he shows me, I will tell you. So he went to a desolate height. He goes off on one of these knolls on a hill by himself, and he's praying. And God speaks to him. Now you jump down to verse 7, and here is the first of four oracles that come to uh, uh, Balaam. And this is in verse uh, 7 of chapter 23. Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram from the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse Jacob for me, and come, denounce Israel. How can I curse whom God has not cursed? And how can I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? From the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. There a people dwelling alone, not reckoning itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number one-fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my end be like his. And Balak hears what Balaam is calling out from this, this knoll over there. And he says, what have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and look, you've blessed them bountifully. Now, you know, what he says there is not by, let me die the death of the righteous, and let my end be like his. That was a prayer of Balaam, but he didn't want to live the life of the righteous. If you want to have a good ending, then you need to make that decision before the end comes. Balaam said, Must I not take heed to speak what the Lord has put in my mouth? And Balak, this guy, he needs to be admired for his persistence. Balak said to him, Please, come with me. Maybe you can curse him from a different angle. <laughs> Isn't that how the devil is? Well, look, if I can't convince you that way, let's convince you this way. We'll just find a new angle. Now you'll, you'll, you looked at, you saw the whole nation spread before you. It was inspiring. It was hard to curse them when you saw how big they were. I'm just going to have you get a hill on the way where you just see the out part of the camp. Maybe you can curse them from there. So he puts them up on the top of Pisgah. You've heard that? 
that's not far from Mount Nebo. And he built seven altars, seven rams, seven bulls on each one. And um, Balaam says, okay, leave me alone. I'm going to see if the Lord speaks to me. Then you get the second oracle. And in this second oracle, he says, rise up, Balak, and hear, listen to me, son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should repent. He has said, will he not do, or has he spoken, will he not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless, and he has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. Now, where does God bless? Have you read in uh, Genesis chapter 12, where God says to Abraham, those who bless you will be blessed and those who curse you will be cursed. God says, I can't change that. Matter of fact, that phrase is uttered three times in the Bible about the people of God. And you are blessed. Whoever blesses you is blessed. Whoever curses you is cursed. And he said, I can't change that. Then Balak said to him, he says to Balaam in verse 25, well, don't curse him. Don't bless him. He says, uh, he said, did I not tell you all that the Lord told me I must speak? Balak is rubbing his hands together. He says, there's got to be a way around this. Please come, I'll take you to another place. <laughs> another angle. Perhaps it will please you that you might curse him from there. So Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor, Mount Peor, which overlooks the wasteland. Now I don't want you to look at them, I want you to look at the wastes. And maybe when you see the ugly wastes, it'll make you think cursing thoughts. It's like, you know, God can be enticed with these omens and incantations. Then Balaam said to Balak, build me again seven altars, offer seven bulls, seven rams. Three times they do that. And when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go at other times to seek to use sorcery, but he said he was somehow mixing sorcery in with what he was doing. He set his face towards the wilderness. And Balaam raised his eyes, and he saw Israel encamped according to their tribes, and the Spirit of God came upon him. He wasn't supposed to look, but he did. And the Spirit of the Lord came on him, and he took up this oracle. And I'll not read it all here. You can look at verse 5. This is the third oracle. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens in the riverside. And then you go to verse 9, and it says... Blessed is he who blesses you, and cursed is he who curses you. That's the same thing you find in Genesis 12, 3, and you also find it in Genesis 27, 29. It's the blessing that God gave to Abraham's descendants, and a blessing for every Christian who is a son of Abraham by faith. Now when Balak hears the final words out of Balaam's mouth, blessed is he who blesses you, and cursed is he who curses you. Why did Balak bring Balaam? To curse him. Balak's anger was aroused. Notice Balaam gets angry and so does Balak. Sort of a sign of the lost is this uncontrolled anger. And he struck his hands together. He stops his feet and he smashes his hands together. And he said, I called you to curse my enemies and look, you bountifully blessed them these three times. Now therefore, go to your place. I said, I greatly honor you. And the Lord has kept you back from honor. So Balaam said to Balak, Did I not also speak to your messengers who you sent to me, saying, If Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, that's what he really wanted, a house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord to do good or bad of my own will? What the Lord says, that I must speak. And now indeed, I'm going to my people. Come, I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the last days. Now he gets a prophecy for free. They don't do the seven altars and the seven bulls and the seven rams. And Balak now issues another prophecy. I will not read it all. You can read it down through verse 24. But notice verse 17. I see him now. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. Meaning in the future. In years to come, centuries to come. A star will come out of Jacob. And a scepter will rise from Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of tumult. Judgment is coming on you. Seir, also his enemies, will be a possession. That's the Edomites, Mount Seir. While Israel does valiantly, out of Jacob one shall have dominion and destroy the remnants of the city. Out of Jacob, who is the one who has dominion? Who is the star that rises? That's Jesus. What prophecy was it that the wise men were reading 
in the land of the east by the Euphrates when they came seeking the king. When Balaam was sent back to his country, his writing, you can be sure Balak the king had a scribe writing things out and were, this was all being recorded. That's why you and I have it. And uh, these prophecies were being studied by the Magi when they saw this mysterious star. This is a star will rise out of Jacob and it was over the land of Israel and it was a sign of a newborn king. It was a prophecy of Balaam. He told true prophecies even though he was a bad prophet. Now, that's a very important point. I want to park here for just a moment. If you get a corrupt televangelist and he's preaching the word of God, can people still be converted? I am amazed sometimes. I won't mention any particular names, but I'll meet people and they say, yeah, I came to faith listening to the preaching of so-and-so. And it's one of these charlatans that are out there in the world. I mean, just some of them ended up in total scandal. They were living double lives. But when they were up preaching, they would open the Bible, they would preach Bible, and there's power inherent in the word. Didn't Jesus send out Judas with the other 12 apostles? Mm -hmm. And Judas, right along with the other 12, he came back and said, even the demons are subject unto us. So there are people that God has used, and just because God is using you, doesn't mean that everything in your life is right. Now, don't wait until everything in your life is right before you let God use you, or he'll never use you. You got that? Jesus said to Peter, at the end of Christ's ministry, Jesus says to Peter, Peter, Satan is desired to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you're converted, Peter's saying, what do you mean when I'm converted? I've been following you three and a half years when I'm converted. I've been out teaching and preaching, casting out devils and doing miracles when I'm converted. God was using the apostles in spite of the fact they weren't thoroughly converted. Don't wait until you feel like you're perfect before you let God use you. But don't let God's using you make you think that you're perfect. You got that? So yeah, God did speak through Balaam. But he was living out of God's will. He was resisting the working of the Holy Spirit in his life. Even the apostles were arguing with each other which of them was the greatest until they were converted. So he gives this fourth prophecy. Now I just want to review a few things. Um, what happened to the children of Israel there on the borders of Canaan are going to happen to God's people again in the last days. You have a confederacy in Revelation of a beast, a dragon, and a false prophet. In the last days, here you've got in this story, you got the Midianites, the Moabites, and a false prophet. And they conspire to destroy God's people. But when they are unsuccessful in attacking God's people from the outside, they go to plan B, and they try to attack from the inside. There's a quote from the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 438. The Moabites dared not risk an attack upon them. An appeal to arms was hopeless in the face of the supernatural agencies that wrought in the behalf of Israel. But they determined, as Pharaoh had done, to enlist the power of sorcery to counteract the work of God. They hoped to bring a curse on Israel. It was kind of like when Simon Magus said to Peter, I'll give you money for the Holy Spirit. You know what Peter said? Your money perish with you. They thought that he, somehow they could bring God down to their level. What does God say about witches and soothsayers? Deuteronomy 18.10 There shall not be found among you anyone who practices witchcraft or a soothsayer or one who interprets omens or a sorcerer. And it seems like Balaam had begun to pick up some of those habits along the way. Matter of fact, Joshua calls Balaam a soothsayer in his book. So they give these oracles, and he, he's unsuccessful. He wants to curse them. There's another statement from the book, uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 443. While all this is going on, what is Israel thinking? Does Israel know that up on the hills that there's a spiritual battle raging and that someone is trying to pronounce a whammy on the whole nation? They have no idea. How little do the Israelites know of what is taking place so near them? How little do they know of the care that God extended over them day and night? How dull are the perceptions of God's people? 
How slow are we in every age to comprehend his great love and mercy? If we could discern the wonderful power of God constantly exerted in our behalf, would not our hearts be filled with gratitude for his love and with awe at the thought of his majesty and power? You know how often the devil is trying to take you out? You know nothing about it. And God is protecting us because you're blessed. And you cannot change what God has blessed except one thing. There is something that can happen where the devil can um, get past your blessing. Balaam on his way home is mad. Here he made this trip. He didn't get any rewards. He didn't get the honor. He didn't, he's going home. He's going to look defeated. And he's thinking along the way, you know, I know. I know there's one way that Balak can win a decisive battle against Israel. If he would entice Israel to be unfaithful to their God and worship other gods, God would withdraw his protection. It's like God had a hedge of angels around Job and the devil said, I can't do anything to Job because you've got a hedge about him. The angel of the Lord encamps round about those that fear him, right? You're blessed if you're obedient. Unless God, like in the story of Job, creates a breach in the hedge, or in the story of Balaam, unless God withdraws his protection because you've driven him away through persistent, high-handed disobedience, he blesses his people. That doesn't mean that we don't ever go through trials. So here's what Balaam's plan was. He got home, and he couldn't take it anymore. He returns. And he gives counsel to Balak. He says, look, I've got a plan. He says, what are you doing back here? He says, i got a plan. He says, if you want to see a victory over Israel, you need to separate them from their God. Me standing on the mountain trying to pronounce a curse on them is not going to do any good. But if you can send the Vestal virgins that worship your God, Shemoth, in among them, make friends with them. There's, they have nothing against you. Israel was not trying to fight a war with Moab. Get involved in some trade, make some friends, and send the girls in and, and invite them to your feasts. And as they have a little drink at the feasts, and they bring out their gods. And that's exactly what happened. Balak took the counsel of um, Balaam. They sent some of the beautiful young ladies in among the young men who were guarding the borders of Israel. And they said, we're having a feast. The food is free. I mean, who doesn't want free food, right? <laughs> and the wine will be flowing freely. And... Uh, they said, oh yeah, we just we offer a little incense to this God, and they entice them, and they begin to worship the other gods. Now all you have to do is turn one page. Go to Numbers chapter 25, and you'll read what Balaam did to Balak. Now Israel remained at Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods. Mm -hmm. And the people ate, and they bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor. You'll often hear of Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. I won't read it all, but if you go down to verse 9. And those who died in the plague were 24,000, 2 times 12. 2 times 12,000 died in this plague. They were able... The Moabites were able to accomplish from the inside what they were unable to accomplish from the outside. What is the devil going to do in the last days as we're on the borders of Canaan? Infiltration. Bring in compromise with the worship of compromised people. You got this picture? I want to make sure this, this is prophecy. This is where it gets real relevant. Um, the Moabites had once worshipped the same God, but they had compromised. Now, they got the true people of God who had the true worship to begin to compromise with their compromise. What's going to happen in the last days? Apostate Protestantism is going to infiltrate God's people. And we are going to begin to want to look like everybody else and all the other churches and we'll go against the word of God for the sake of unity. Hey, we're neighbors. Can't we all get along? You know? And we'll begin to eat and drink instead of coming aside and being separate. And there'll be a compromise. You can read in Revelation 2 verse 14. But I have a few things against you because you have there that hold those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. Who taught Balak 
to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel. You notice it doesn't say Balaam who successfully cursed Israel. He couldn't. But what he did do, he taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things, sacrifice to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. It started with the wrong sacrifice, and then next thing you knew, it went all the way. What did the children of Israel do while Moses was getting the Ten Commandments? Golden calf, had a feast, worshiped, and at the end of it all, it says they were naked. And I'll leave that to your imagination. It just began to compromise with the world. You can read in Numbers chapter 31. Look, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. You can read in Numbers 25. Oh, I actually just read that one to you. You look in Judges 16. Now I'm in the book of Judges. Afterward it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. So what brought down, what brought down Samson? He began to uh, make friends with the enemy, eating and drinking with the others. What happened to Solomon? Solomon was true to the Lord, but he loved many women, and he loved women of the Moabites. Did you ever catch that? And pretty soon he set up an idol to Moab in the temple of God, and the temple started going. The church started going down. Psalm 106, verse 28. They joined themselves also to Baal of Peor, and they ate sacrifices made to the dead. They got mixed up on the state of the dead, too. They provoked him to anger with their deeds, and the plague broke out among them. So, you can see that this is uh, what happened. But in the end, Baal got his reward. The king said, okay, that worked. There's a plague among the people. God withdrew his protection. You've weakened them. Let's just keep it up. Finally, when Israel what they were, knew what they were doing, they fought against Moab and they defeated them. And in that battle, Numbers 31.8, they killed the kings of Midian with the rest of those who were killed, Evi, Rechem, Zur, Hur, Reba, the five kings of Midian, Balaam, the son of Beor, they also killed with a sword. You read in Joshua 13.22, the children of Israel also killed with the sword Balaam, the son of Beor, the soothsayer among those who are killed by them. And then you read in the New Testament in Jude 1.11, Woe to them, for they've gone in the way of Cain, and they've run greedily in the error of Balaam. Balaam was running greedily for profit. Balaam, you could say, was a prophet that did not have a non-profit ministry. He had a for-profit ministry. But he didn't profit in the end. Because Jesus said, what profit is it? If you gain the whole world, then you lose your soul. Balaam lost everything. You know, Jesus said, Luke chapter 12, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself, what shall I do? I've got no room to store my crops. He said, this will I do. I'll pull down my barns, I'll build bigger barns, and there I'll store all my crops and my goods. This is greed, covetousness. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you've got many goods laid up for many years. Take your easy drink and be merry. But God said, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then who will those things be for which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. We all really have two choices. We can store our treasure there. Balaam wanted his treasure here. Balaam thought you could serve two masters. You can't. He said, I want to serve God in mammon. You can't. If you're trying to serve both, you will serve money. Judas tried to serve both. But Judas sold the Savior for silver. And he ended up losing in the end. And you can read the story of Gehazi. You can read the story of Simon Magus, who tried to buy the Holy Spirit. And the Roman soldiers who were willing to deny that they saw Christ rise from the dead because they were bribed for money. I think it was Charles Spurgeon that said, uh, I've seen a lot of people come to the Lord, but I've never seen a covetous person converted. It's a very dangerous thing. So there's some things we can learn from the story of Balaam. Uh, there's some important warnings there, and there's some encouragement. The encouragement is that God cares about donkeys, right? <laughs> and that God can speak through a donkey. That means he cares about us, and he can speak through us too. Amen? Amen. 
And so we just want to make sure that we seek first his kingdom and have those priorities. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world? A man's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. I don't know about you, friends, but uh, I'd rather have Jesus. Amen? Amen. I don't know if you caught it, but that's our closing song. We're going to sing, now, I think it's a misprint in your bulletin. It's supposed to be 327. Is that right? I'd rather have Jesus. We'll invite our song leaders to come up, and let's stand together as we sing all three verses.